All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. A little chilly today, huh? You know, but you gotta look. You gotta look at take things in perspective. All right. What I have here is the last heating bill from the oil company. So just think, all we're saving because this last bill was seven hundred twenty-seven dollars and seventy-seven cents. So think of all the money we're saving. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta laugh a little bit, don't you? We're here today, folks. Hey, just and another thing to keep this in perspective. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a maybe we're a little uncomfortable, right? It's a little chilly. This might be the coldest we've ever had a service here, like in like since 1993. This might be the only time we didn't have heat. But uh, there are people in the world that are really cold right now. I mean, there's people, just think of the people, let's, let's read in the news of Ukraine. These people are out there, they've got their coats on, they're, they're fleeing their country. We're uncomfortable, I get it, but we can come here, we can glorify God, we can come here and praise and be here. Isn't this good? Palm Sunday. Please stand up, and if you want to, you can raise your palms. All right, and let's sing with the praise team.
tempted and tried, you ran. The Word became flesh for my sin and death. Now you're Everything I once held dear, I count it all as lost. Lead me to the cross where your love poured out. Bring me to my knees, Lord, I lay me down. Rid me of myself, I belong to you. Oh, lead me, lead me to the cross, to your heart. Sunday, you know, Jesus was led to the cross through Palm Sunday, wasn't he? To make that triumphal entry into Jerusalem, leading us to the cross, changing our hearts. That's what he was doing. He came to change our hearts. Folks, this week, I'm going to message today. I'll do the best I can, but your hearts, I really hope that your hearts are changed by the Word of God. You're conformed into His image this very day. And having said that, give each other a wave, say hello. You're cold. I know you're cold. We're all cold. It's good. I'll heat, I'll, I'm, when you, after you wave, have a seat, and I'll preach really hard. How's that? I'll heat this place up. We'll do one of those old-fashioned messages where I run around and spit and scream. How's that? Oh, man, going down to junior church. Listen to that chatter. They're having a good time going down there, huh? They're going down there. It's not any warmer down there, though, so don't try and get out, okay? It's not any warmer downstairs. It's just chilly up there. But, uh, hey, folks, as we get, before we get this message, I just want you to uh, call to mind. Please remember uh, our brother Dan. His, uh, his eyes are really, how do you say, they're messed up. He's in a lot of pain, okay? He's in a lot of pain. Uh, yesterday, one eye was shut and all things. He's been to the doctors again. They're working on it, okay? So uh, he's going to the best hospital there is, I guess, Mass Eye and Ear. So uh, I know there's nothing that we can do but be concerned, I guess, and pray for him. And then, of course, if Melissa has any needs, that's the easy stuff for us to do to fulfill, right? Uh, but uh, just keep him in mind as we, as, as we, uh, as we go through your day. Just call him to mind. We should be calling each other to mind all the time because it's very easy to focus. I can focus on myself real easily. <laughs> you know, I can, you know, I can't wait for lunch. I don't even know what it is yet. But I, I worry about Pete really well. But uh, our minds on others. But today, today was Palm Sunday. It's Palm Sunday. And I'm hoping, hey, you know what I'd like to do next year because I haven't done it? I want to get palms. If someone would just help me to remember, you got to order them ahead of time. But the palms are so much fun. The kids love it afterwards. They get the, you know. We were talking about they stab each other, they have fun with them and stuff, and you wave them. It's just fun. So, you know, if, we, if someone could just help me out there, we have these palms there. Because palms don't grow around here, it turns out. All the places I like to visit, though, they do. Oh, well, got, Joe's got a, a paper one back there. I want the real deal, Joe. I'm liking it, though. But uh, I like traveling to the places where they have real palms. You know, I can be with those. I, I, I'm becoming much more of a warm weather guy, so today's a little rough for me. A little rough for me, but. I call this message the popularity of Palm Sunday. 
popular. I got a variety of texts in this, sort of all over the map. It's okay. You're here. But what is it to be popular? To be popular, you're, you're liked, right? You're, you're liked. You're admired. You're enjoyed by many people, or maybe just one or a few people. You're popular, and that's good. On the most simplistic level, it's nice to be liked and to have kindness shown towards us. You know, even a simple smile can give you an inkling that you're popular with someone, right? When someone smiles at you, you feel good. I, I, people smile at you, right? I love going to store. I love smiling at people and saying hi to them and stuff. I just like turning at people to a smile like that. It's so much fun to do. I just, you know, I'm a sicko. I just like making people happy. What am I going to do? I don't belong here. I belong in heaven. But uh, when you're popular sometimes, right? That's true. You're popular. You're the man. That guy, he is just popular. He's just, yeah. What can I say? You know, and he's just there, and everyone's loving him. He's just loving him. The guy down on the lower right is going to give him the thumbs up. That's kind of cool, right? And we can get caught up in the tide of popular real easily, though. We really can. Popularity. Everything's, when it's popular, everyone's on board. You get that vibe. It's all good. It's all go forward. This is popular. It's comfortable. It's frictionless. Let's go. It's popular, right? But what happens when being popular isn't an option? You know? What if, uh, what if, uh, if, uh, if something, what if being popular is predicated on something that's a poor rationalization? Well, this is really popular. Yeah, but that's not a good idea. I don't want to be part of that. Will you be popular? What will you do? What will you do if it gets to that situation? I, I read this article, as, so I was looking at popularity, and I saw, you know, I was scanning the internet, okay, and I found this uh, research article on popularity. I'm just going to read you this, this first sentence of it. That's all you need. It says, this is a research thing that's going on. It says, the goal of research in automatic image popularity assessment, automatic image popularity assessment, assessment IPA, is to develop computational models that can accurately predict the potential of a social image going viral on the internet. Being popular is a real big deal. They get, they get put into a, a computer model to figure out if that image is gonna, gonna click when it goes to the internet. Well, I read part of the article, I kind of stopped, because I didn't really need any more information. Because uh, if that's my quest for popularity, and if that's your quest for it, if it's, you, you lose your identity in that. And you're not going to gain the identity of Christ in that if you're just looking for popularity. You're really not. So I stopped reading the article. But today we're going to look at some highs and lows in Jesus' life regarding his popularity. Because it did vary. We're not going to look at all of them. But I wanted to just accentuate a few of them that led up to the entrance into, uh, into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. I thought it would be interesting. It's not an exhaustive study, but a few things I think we'll learn from it. So what I did, I put... I put uh, Four points here, popularity points. And these are not points on how to be popular, OK? Let's get that up straight. These are popularity points that we're going to look at. I want to talk about the rise to popularity that Jesus had, the fall from popularity that Jesus had. He had a great fall from popularity. Palm Sunday popularity, which we're having today. And what's the gain of popularity? All these things regarding popularity. I thought I'd just pop in there about popularity. Well, let's have a word of prayer first. Father, I do thank you for this morning. I thank you for those that are here, Lord. We're chilly, Lord. We're cold. But, Father, this is an inconvenience, and I thank you for it. I just pray that this, in and of itself, would give us an inkling of how wonderfully you do take care of us and let us have love pour out on others that do not have all the blessings, incredible blessings you've given us, Lord. We thank you and praise you, Father, and I thank you, uh, to have the opportunity to give this message. Please guide my heart and mind and my lips that I would say the words that you would have said, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So Jesus rise to popularity, okay? Why did Jesus' popularity grow so much? Was, it, was he trying to fulfill his ego? I don't think so, do you? No, it wasn't. But uh, did he really need to hear that, well, you're really a good teacher? I don't think so, but he was. But it is nice to get positive feedback, isn't it? I mean, I, you just like positive feedback. So when, when I always like to do this. So when the different cleaning crews are going to clean. Whenever I see someone cleaning here, I want to give them positive feedback. Because you don't see anyone when they're cleaning, right? You don't see them unless you see them, right? We don't see them now. So it, it's, it's important. It, it's a job that can be done. No one sees it. Of course, you see it when something's left messy. I know. Sometimes we'll make a mess during the week, and the cleaning people will miss it. 
It just happens. But when it be, when it, be it, it makes you feel good. Someone just is cognizant of the fact you've done something. But we've seen in the beginning of the book of John how Jesus sort of came out of obscurity, didn't he? John the Baptist is out there baptizing people. Jesus comes on the scene, and what does John say? Behold, the Lamb of God has come to take away the sins of the world. Boom! Jesus sort of appears. He comes onto the scene. It was cool. Certain things transpire. And if you've seen these past couple of weeks, we've been in John chapter 3, with this whole dialogue between John and his disciples. And his disciples are saying to John, hey, how come Jesus is so much more popular than you? You were the man. We were doing it. What's going on here, right? It was like a popularity contest, and they didn't get it. John's trying to get across to him that he had a job to do. He's the voice of one crying in the wilderness, okay? He's trying to get there. He's making straight the way of the Lord, but they couldn't see that. They couldn't understand it. It was hard for them. And in Jesus' ministry, his words and the way he explained the word of God, it opened people's eyes. He didn't say it like everyone else. He just didn't. Think about it. God was incarnate in Jesus. Jesus' name was Emmanuel, God with us. Okay, God with us. No other worship system has ever existed or ever will exist that can make that claim. It's all in Jesus. God is with us. That was his name. And Jesus taught crazy things, didn't he? Like, love your neighbor, right? Who does that? I mean, I love your neighbor. No, I don't mean love your neighbor. I mean, uh, love your enemies. No, you want me to love my enemy? Are you serious? Because that wasn't the culture then. And I wouldn't say exactly that's a culture we have right now to love our enemies, is it? But Jesus told us to. We were supposed to do that. We might not want to admit it sometimes that we don't love our enemies so much. But, you know, if we do admit it, we might start to love them. It's an important thing. And Jesus' messages so often would be punctuated by a miracle or a sign, weren't they? The affirmation of his divinity. He left no doubt. They weren't just nice words. It would be, boom, you get a miracle. His popularity was really shown at the Sermon on the Mount. It was amazing what it did. And you can see it from two different Gospels, in the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of Ma uh, and Matthew's Gospel. And, and, and it's interesting when you see in, in Luke's Gospel, when it's a shorter version of it, if you will, Jesus comes down on a level plane with everyone, for, level plane with everyone first. I just want to read this text to you from Luke chapter 6, starting verse 17. It says, this is regarding Jesus. Jesus came down with them and stood on a level place with the crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of the people from Judea and Jerusalem. So he's down with a huge crowd of his disciples, a lot more than 12, okay? There's a lot of them. And from the coast of uh, Tyre and Sidon, and they came to hear him and be healed of their diseases, as well of those who were tormented with unclean spirits. And the whole multitude sought to touch him, for power went out for him, and he healed them all. They just wanted to touch Jesus. Just touch him. Power went out for them. And that immediately goes back. Do you remember the woman with the issue of blood? There was a great crowd. She's in there. She just touches the hem of Jesus' garment. And what it's like, he, she, he touches it, and he goes, whoa. What was that? Jesus sort of said. Power went out from him. Your, your, your faith has healed you, sister. Your faith has healed you. Power went out from him so much. And then we get these, the maps. I always like my maps, right? But this is where they were. Jesus, at this point, he's up in Sea of Galilee in, in Capernaum. He's up in that area, right? People are traveling from Jerusalem. They're not going through Samaria because we hate Samaritans, right? <laughs> Supposed to love your enemies. Well, we're going to hate our Samaritans. They say, crazy, we can do this. We can do this today, folks. We can dislike people. And we, they went up here to get there, and they came down from Tyree and Sidon. That's outside of Galilee. And remember, with Tyree and Sidon, just think back historically. We spoke about this before. That's where Jezebel was from, Ahab's wife, that sweet young lady that tried to kill Elijah, right? All these people come from all these to this very place because of Jesus. He was so popular. He was healing people. Just, just, just there, he was healing the sick, those tormented with spirits. He was doing all these things. <laughs> and it is funny, those people from uh, Judea, just a little bit of like <clears throat> prejudice. The Jews from Judea really didn't like the Jews from Galatia. They were low class. And I thought about that, right? And then I looked in that mirror. Don't you hate looking in the mirror? 
I don't know about you guys. I said, I think I'm like, you know, okay, don't hold this against me, any of you, okay? I'm just being transparent, all right? I'm a little, bit, I'm a little nervous saying this. I used to really think that people from the South weren't that sophisticated because I'm from Boston. That's what we were taught, right? I would never say the term y'all. I would never say the term y'all. I just wouldn't say it because that's from down South. Wouldn't do that. Dumb as a box of rocks, right? Preconceived notion based on absolutely nothing. Go there. You know what was really dumb about it? Saying y'all is so much fun. To go through all those years not saying, y'all, y'all, we got to do this. Y'all want to go? Y'all is fun to say. The silliness that we do in our lives. The Judeans were doing that to the Galatians. Bostonians do this to people down south. People do it everywhere. These preconceived notions of these, these prejudices we have are just nuts at times. It really stuck out to me. I got that off my chest. Thank you. I got that prejudice out of my life. There's more to go, folks. I got more. Boy, I have issues. But then you jump to Matthew chapter 5, right? Matthew 5. And this on the Sermon on the Mount, it's a little bit different. Because at this point, Jesus goes to speak to them, and he's not down on a flat plain. It's sort of like that event took place, and then he goes up onto the mount, and he sits down, as all the rabbis would, to teach the people. And, I, and they were so popular there. But unlike any rabbi that had ever lived, the sermon redefines the relationship between God and mankind. You go to the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 5 of Matthew 5, 6, and 7. It's amazing when you read through this. It's amazing. Jesus spoke of being salt and light. How murder and adultery are an issue of the heart. Of the heart. Going the second mile for a person and loving your enemies. All these things. His popularity soared at this point, okay? People were being drawn to him. But things changed, now don't they? Because Jesus had a tremendous fall from popularity. John chapter 6. Did he come unpop unpopular? He feeds the 5,000 in John chapter 6. John chapter 6 is a long chapter. He got like 60, 80 verses. I don't know. There's a lot in there. But he, he feeds the 5,000. He does a few miracles, okay? And it says this in, in, in verse 15. It says, Jesus perceived they are about to take, come and take him and force him to be their king. Think about that. He was so popular, you're going to be our king. It wasn't like he wasn't running for office, folks. There was no campaign placards like the vote yesterday here in Dedham we had. No, no, no. That's how popular he was in that moment. But the moment changed very quickly in the same chapter. It really did. Because Jesus knew their hearts. He knew what their hearts were really about. Because in verse 26, Jesus says, Most assuredly I say to you, you seek me not because of the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Whew. You're going to be our king. You only want me to be king because I fed you. You don't believe in anything I'm saying. Jesus wasn't looking to be popular, was he? He becomes real unpopular real quick. Being honest will do that sometimes. It really will. If you don't believe me, I just did, that's that. Then he goes on to tell them that he's the bread of life. He tells them this, and what do these people say to him? They said him in verse 30. Therefore, they said to him, what sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe in you? What work will you do? Can you imagine that? He's just fed the 5,000. Catch this. He fed the 5,000. And when you read that account, you'll see that it's not like a bunch of people are coming to uh, praise him. They ate the food. But now they say to him, well, what sign are you going to do so we will believe you? Really? You need another sign? <laughs> you need another sign? Just fed 5,000 people. It's amazing. It's an amazing event. They didn't look for a sign. They were looking for another loaf of bread. That's what they were looking for. And Jesus told them that he was the bread of life. I am the living bread which comes down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which I shall give is my flesh which I shall give for the life of the world. They couldn't handle that. They couldn't handle that. They're thinking, we're going to eat your flesh? They weren't getting it. They had no idea what Jesus was trying to get across to them. They had no idea they were going to give his, he was going to give his body, his life for them. They have no concept of this. Their minds have been changed to something so earthly in this. They couldn't handle it. 
So what do they say to Jesus? Because they don't like what they're hearing, right? You don't like what you're hearing. This is what they say to him. Isn't this the son of Joseph? And we know his mother? Get that. So Jesus did all these things. Says, well, aren't you just Joseph's son? And probably Mary was right there. How quickly the popularity flipped, didn't it? Yeah, it did. There was like a brick wall. They were not picking up anything that Jesus was putting down except the bread. They only got what they wanted. That's all they were interested in. And Jesus' popularity really gets revealed at the end of John chapter 6, in verses 66 to 68. It says, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Remember, when he came down in Luke, there was crowds around him, right? They were following him. Now it says many of them did not walk with him anymore. And Jesus turned and he said, to the 12, would you leave me also? And Simon Peter says, to whom shall we go? You have the words of life, right? But only the 12 remained. Isn't that amazing? Wasn't so popular anymore, huh? Said the truth. You don't believe me. When people hear what they want to hear, when they get what they want to get, they're with you. You're popular. I like you, Pete. You're popular, right? It's what we do. We don't mean to. But what happens when there's a drought, a flood, a pandemic? Any time of trial, upheaval or disagreement, do you really want to depend on popularity then? Is that going to be your foundation, popularity? Things happen like this in churches all the time today, you know, all the time. People go to a church to get filled at that church. Then they decide at some point the church isn't meeting their needs. You go to get filled? Filled with what? Your needs? What are your needs? I hear this phrase, and you probably all heard this phrase at different points in your lives. Well, I'm not being fed at that church. I'm not being fed. But of course, that's what the 5,000 that were fed said as well, right? Feed us some more. Give us some more bread. We want more. You know, if, 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 if Sunday's your only spiritual meal you get during the week, you're on a very severe fast. You need to be in the Word of God, okay? I tell you what, I'm going got, got, to have 37 minutes run in my mouth. This is not what you want to subsist on. Take some of my stuff, but I'm not going to take you. By Thursday, you're going to be dead meat. <laughs> I'm not being fed. I'm not being fed. I'm uncomfortable. There's not something here for me. Then people go to another house of worship to be filled. You know what that is? That's a one-way street. My way. Fill me. Fill me. Fill me. That's what it is. I'm fairly sure, and if you don't think I'm correct, I'll give you my resignation immediately after this message. I'm fairly sure that we're called to love one another. We're to love our neighbor as we would want to be loved. The implication here is that we're filling someone else. We are called to fill other people, folks. Love does for others. By default, if we love others, we will be filled. If we love others, we will be filled. If that's a little foreign concept to you and you're having a hard time with that, Listen, if you, don't, if you hear anything else in my message, it's not that important. Please come talk to me. You need to understand what that means. Because everything else is garbage that I got to say if you don't get that. Honestly, if we're loving others, we will be filled. It's a feeling that the bread won't ever do. Not even fresh, fresh baked bread. I know, I love it too. It won't cut it. It just will not cut it. We have one life. If church is not your life, what is? My family, my job, my this. Well, your children are going to grow up and go away. Your job, you'll probably change to different ones. Right here, this is a family, the family of God. This is the family of eternity. I'm telling you right now. See, the miracles and signs were just that. They were signs. What do signs do? You drive down the road, a sign points you someplace. You do not get to your destination unless you follow the sign, correct? It's a simple thing there. You must follow the sign to the destination. Now, Jesus was very, very unpopular at this point. <laughs> Only 12 have followed him, okay? But his popularity does get rekindled, and it does with Palm Sunday. It really does. What's Palm Sunday? When Jesus went to Jerusalem for his final Passover before the crucifixion. 
his popularity was high again. And we're going to see it's a little bit off the charts in reality, okay? He entered Jerusalem on a donkey. And people were putting down palm fronds in front of him in their cloaks, which is how a king would be greeted. That's what it was. It was a king's entrance. It was a spontaneous outpouring for him. It wasn't coerced, okay? It wasn't like, you guys going to go out and worship this guy coming in or we're going to have a problem. No, there was no coercion here. They couldn't be stopped that people were so excited about his coming. No coercion whatsoever. He enters Jerusalem with shouts of, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us, save us, right? And my little cartoon character, I love this Jesus coming in. Is there, that's what he would have looked like, everyone coming in. By saying Hosanna, as Jesus passed through those gates of Jerusalem, the Jews were acknowledging that Jesus was their Messiah. The Jews have been waiting a long time. They've been waiting a long time for the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. That's what they're waiting for. The shouts of Hosanna in the highest indicate that the hope that their Messiah had finally come to set up his kingdom then and there. That's what they were at. But what prompted their cry for this? What got them so amped up? What were they so excited about? I think we need to give a whole lot more weight to the miracle that Jesus performed immediately before this, which was the resurrection of Lazarus. Because sometimes they say, well, Jesus resurrected Lazarus, and then this. No. This is an incredibly important miracle that was, this was someone resurrected. Resurrected. This is really important in the Bible. Just a few days before, Jesus resurrected. We don't know the exact number of days. We know it's more than six. I can figure that much out. But uh, uh, he raised him to the dead. Time is so significant because it's done immediately before the Passover. Before the Passover. People are traveling from everywhere to get to Jerusalem, right? If you were coming down from the north, you would have come down the east side of the Jordan River. You'd have crossed over at Jericho, and you'd have headed over towards Jerusalem to go through Bethlehem where Lazarus lived, okay, and died. And think about the Passovers that everyone's going to come to. Jesus is going to go to Passovers his whole life. It must have really been disappointing sometimes, huh? The whole, your whole life, seeing how the Passover has degraded, degraded. Remember the first Passover that we, we see recorded here at the beginning of his ministry? He flipped over tables. He said, eh, you're not going to do this anymore. During the Passion Week, he flips them over again. They didn't get it the first time. But at any rate, at any rate, the scenario of Lazarus' uh, resurrection, Jesus and his disciples were on the east side of the Jordan River in the same basic location where John the Baptist baptized Jesus at the beginning of his ministry, okay? Going back to the beginning to get to the end, effectively. Do you ever think about that? That's the same place where he was baptized, but not when he was called the Lamb of God. This is where it's all going to kick off to get him into Jerusalem for Palm Sunday. I found that incredibly interesting. I love finding tidbits in the Word of God. Says, I go, oh, yeah, that's really cool, because it is. So his disciples, they're on that they're east side over there, and John, John where, where, the, where, where that took place. And word gets said to him that Lazarus is sick unto death. Sick unto death. But Jesus deliberately, no one travels. They stayed right there. So Lazarus' home was about 20 miles to the west, right? Near Jerusalem. 20 miles away. They could have got there pretty quick. They're in Bethlehem. I mean, Bethany, excuse me. Bethany is the V word. And understand that Bethany is about three-quarters of a mile from Jerusalem, okay? That's like the distance from the church down to Sunoco Station. Put in perspective. That's not far away, is it? You know, the only thing in between the Bethany and Jerusalem is the Mount of Olives. Think about the location, what people do, and how they're moving around. That's where they are at. Everything's very close at this point, okay? They're not far away. But Jesus doesn't go because God's plan is for Lazarus to die. That doesn't sound popular, <laughs> right? Think of that for a minute. God's plan was for Lazarus to die. When I thought of that, I said, oof, I paused. Then I remembered God's sovereign. There is a plan. There is a plan. And Jesus shows up at the home of Mary and Martha, right? Lazarus is there after Lazarus is buried ensuring that Lazarus was dead. And they knew, the disciples knew, now if they went to Judah, 
If Jesus showed himself publicly, they were dead. They were dead. They really were. Thomas, you know what Thomas says before they leave? He goes, let's go with them so we can die. <laughs> Imagine that. Okay, Jesus, you want to go? I'm going with you. We're going to die. That was it. You go, I go. This is it. That's what he did. Because Jesus wasn't popular with everyone. No, I mean, he wasn't. And after this, he's going to become very popular, but still not with everyone. So Jesus shows up in Bethany very publicly, very publicly. And Jesus, when he gets there, the death of Lazarus, he remains in the moment so well. Time is so crucial, right? Jesus is confronted by and or confronts the sisters. That confrontation doesn't mean to be it's like a battle. They're coming together. They're coming together. They knew each other. They loved each other. He felt their pain. He was with them emotionally and physically. He really was. See, they came to Jesus brokenhearted. They came to him brokenhearted. This is where that, that shortest verse in the Bible comes through. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. It's so heartfelt to me. Before Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, he told him on no uncertain terms who he was, what he was going to do. Jesus said to her, this is to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? This is what he says to Martha. What's she going to say? Yes, Lord, I believe. But of course, what was her belief? And I understand this. I understand this. She's thinking the resurrection in the last days, right? She has no idea that Jesus means he's going to raise Lazarus right then and right there. Okay? We're going to go for it, Martha. This is going to happen. This is going to happen. She didn't get this. He made that declaration for everyone to see, everyone to understand. Timing is everything. It really is. And he raises Lazarus from the dead. And people see this. They see this. And then he follows on later. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things, things Jesus did believed him. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things that Jesus did. I got to that text and I said, wow. How do, I, how, how do I rectify? How do I rationalize those two positions? Those two positions. Some people see if they believe. The others, they go to the Pharisees. Did they believe? I mean, you saw someone raised from the dead, right? He comes from the dead. He's to, he had his burial shroud on. When you read the whole account, it's amazing. It's amazing. How do you do that? Imagine witnessing someone being raised from the dead and thinking, it's a bad thing? I'm not quite sure. I tried to put myself... Always try and put yourself in the other person's position, even if it's unpopular. Think it through. Think, you might not get the answer. That's okay. Give it a shot. Give it a shot. You know, perhaps they went to the Pharisees because they were simply so indoctrinated that even if the truth was before their eyes, they had to have it verified by someone else. That's, that's, that's incredible. And remembering this, resurrection was a core belief of the Pharisees. It really was. That's kind of cultish in nature, isn't it? I need you to tell me. You need me to tell you to believe in something. You need to have it presented to you. It's up to you to believe. It's between the person and God. It's not predicated on the Pharisees, right? I just think of this as I was getting there, where these, where these people are at. It must have been hard for them. No one can force anyone to believe. It needs to come from a person's heart. Jesus entered Jerusalem as a king. His popularity had soared tremendously. Twice, two, two times since he raised Lazarus from the dead, twice he's anointed with oil. Six days before his entry and two days before his entry. If you read through the gospel accounts, all of them, Jesus was anointed with oil three times. If you do a study, a, a careful study, I love the study of the anointing of Jesus. I, I've studied it so many times, I just love it. I just love it. He's anointed with oil, because only a king is anointed with oil. It's very expensive. But a king was considered worthy of being anointed with oil. That's why it happened, folks. It was just magnifying the fact that Jesus is king. His popularity is so great that as he entered into the city, he had zero immediate concern for his life. There's nothing to worry about. The crowds were there. Thomas was sure when they, when they went there that they were going to die, right? And only Jesus was going to die. 
His death would be there, but his death would be a sacrifice. Would not be the way we would think of it. It was his sacrifice. Because as many, many sacrifices are going to take place. It's the Passover. There's only going to be one perfect sacrifice. That's Christ. He's going to be the perfect sacrifice. And you think of the people. How could they know that Jesus was coming as a perfect sacrifice? See, we have perspective. We have the full written word of God. They couldn't know this. How could they know this? This is incredible. Just like those people that rejected Jesus, you know, about, you know, what, we're going to eat your flesh? That wasn't what he meant. But everything has to get revealed, the full word of God, before we can fully comprehend, because Jesus has not gone to the cross yet. Got to the cross. Jesus was a literal sacrifice. God's way is not our ways, right? Remember, he tells us to love our enemies. It's crazy. And remember as well, Jesus is not dodging death. Oh, no, no, no. He's on the road to Golgotha. That's where he's headed, okay? It's just during this Passion Week, between Palm Sunday and Easter, there's so many things that need to happen, so many teachings that are going to happen. Some tables need to get flipped over again as you read through it. I hope this week you spend some time and read through this. It's incredible. There's so many events happen. I get excited when I, 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 read, I read through them, and I read through them, and I think, what am I going to talk about next Sunday? I can't say all this because the people aren't going to stay for three hours. They'll leave. If I had pizza, I could get you to stay. But... Uh, the Passion Week is rich, rich in teaching. The miracle of Lazarus was explosive. His timing was ordained for the entrance into Jerusalem. Just remember, in Galilee, remember Jesus' first miracle? He turned the water to wine. Just a few people saw, huh? It was kind of secret, wasn't it? Right? Just a few people, Mary, two disciples, a couple of servants. That's it. Lazarus, when he was resurrected, many, many people saw this. Many people. They were traveling from, to Jerusalem. The place was crowded at Bethany. They saw this happen. There's a reason, the timing. The timing is so important. It really is. Punctuating who he is with miracles. He could overcome death. And as Jesus then, afterwards, he's traveling. He's traveling finally to Jerusalem over the Mount of Olives, because that's all that's in between, right? From Bethany to Jerusalem, it's just the Mount of Olives. You either travel around it, go down the Kidron Brook a little bit and go up, or you go over the Mount of Olives. He's coming off the Mount of Olives. And, and, and as he comes off the Mount of Olives, it says, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Whew. These accolades infuriated the Pharisees. They were, they were ripped, okay? Think of it, they were right there. They had to be right there, okay? They just were. They told Jesus to rebuke his disciples. They really did. Think about this a minute. Remember that the scene? He's coming down. He's on a donkey. People are going around. He's doing this. They had to be right there, okay? They were probably walking up to Jesus. He's on a donkey. He's on the colt, telling him, finger in his face, rebuke them. They, they, they were right there. This is face-to-face, -face, folks. There's no texting. There's no Snapchat. There's no Instagram. None of that nonsense. This is breath on breath. That's how it was. It was real. It's real. Oh, that we would speak to each other directly all the time. All the nonsense in this world would go away if we actually sit, even with people we disagree with. We find out there's a whole lot more agreement than we think. There really is. And I would hope and I would think that the resurrection of Lazarus would have impacted many of the Pharisees. And I believe it did, but not all. It did not. Jesus made it clear, though, didn't he? If the crowds would stop, the stones themselves would cry out who he was. See, he's sovereign. It doesn't make any difference. It doesn't make any difference. It can't be stopped. It can't be stopped. The crowd believed he was Messiah. They did not understand that he had not come to set up his earthly kingdom yet. Regardless, he received that king's entrance. Palm branches in their robes, down in the robe before him. This, literally, folks, is the royal treatment. That's the royal treatment. That's what he got on his entrance. You see, Jesus was hope. And the population of Jerusalem has swelled at this time. It's great. It's big. Popular is an understatement. All the popularity, all the popularity was of no consequence to Jesus. Because he has a mission, doesn't he? He has a mission that he's on. He's going to Golgotha. 
He's going to the cross. But what's the gain of popularity? Craving for popularity is part of the pride of life. It really is. In 1 John 2, 6, what does it say? For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. We need to be concerned about what is of the Father, not is it of the world. The world's always, it's just going to be there. We need to be concerned about the Father's will in all these things. Where was Jesus' eyes is focused? Not in the world. Jesus said, if you want to see the kingdom of God, in John 3, 7, you must be born again. If you want to see it. That vision is spiritual, folks. To see that well, you must be born again. It's kind of funny, huh? It's better than 2020. To see that well, you need to do what John 3.30 says. He must increase and I must decrease. That's a wonderful place to be, folks. As we decrease and he increases in our lives, joy comes out and we have love. We'll have love for others. You'll be fulfilled in a way that you will never have had before if you've not had that. Jesus cared nothing for popularity that was reflected in Palm Sunday. That parade atmosphere was great, but he'd been the center of attention before and completely rejected, right? He was run out of his own hometown. They're going to run him off a cliff, right? He understood this. Jesus knew he'd be rejected again in a few days as well, wouldn't he? See, popularity can fail the test of faith. It did for those who re rejected Jesus after they had their bellies full, didn't it? Those 5,000, they rejected him. Their faith meant nothing. It did, the, 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 think of it, the rejection. That rich young ruler, okay, he came to Jesus. Jesus was so popular in his mind. And Jesus told him to leave everything behind and follow me. He was so disappointed because that's not the answer he was looking for. Jesus was never about popularity. Jesus was about the will of the Father. The will of the Father will put us in unpopular positions sometimes. Remember that the will of the Father will put you in unpopular positions at times. <coughs> then what? What are you going to do when you're in that not popular position? Because think of Jesus. What did he do? He continued on to Golgotha. He continued on to agony, torment, and humiliation. There's our example. The Lazarus moment was a sign, folks. A huge sign that gained him a glorious entrance of popularity, the royal treatment. He got his Palm Sunday. But we must weigh our popularity because rejection will come. Rejection will come. Will we compromise to avoid being unpopular? Will we? I hope not. Though many cry, crucify him, there's those that trusted it and they wept. Because as Jesus went to the cross on that road, bearing the cross, it says in Luke 23, 27, and a great multitude of people followed him, and the women who also mourned and lamented. They were weeping after Christ. See, we're not called to be popular. We're not called to judge. We're called to do the will of the Father. Jesus told them to follow him. Think of this. Those that followed him, you know what he told them to do? Don't weep. Imagine that. He's going to the cross, beaten, mutilated. Don't weep. Don't weep. Because one day, he's going to wipe away every tear of all the children of God. Don't weep. He was completing his mission. He wasn't trying to be popular. It's an amazing thing. That's some kind of popular. So Palm Sunday... 2,000 years ago, that's quite an opening act, wasn't it, for Easter? It really was. <coughs> Jerusalem was cracked open wide. The people couldn't contain themselves. But only by doing the will of the Father would the ride to Jerusalem ever happen. It wasn't popular, but it was purposeful. We're going to go through rides in our lives. We might have some rides into a areas that we might think are hostile. Don't compromise ever. Don't compromise to be popular. To be like Christ, we need to endure. And we need to love these people. 
even if they despitefully use you and they hate you and they use those hard words. It doesn't make any difference. Christ is our example. Palm Sunday, he went in. It was a beautiful day, but things are going to get rough by the end of the week, aren't they? Yet he still went. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this day, Father. I thank you we get to celebrate Palm Sunday, Lord. And Lord, it would be fun if we can have palms next year. Sure, that's fun. But let us call to mind what was happening, that popularity of Jesus entering. The focus was on him. Then the focus would be on the cross. That tremendous journey to Golgotha, Lord. Help us just put this in our minds and our hearts this week, Lord, and remember what you did to us. You loved us completely with your life. Let us give our lives to you, Lord, as a call about assembly. We thank and praise you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Next year we'll get the palms. I promise. I promise. I promise. So it's a little cold. That's good. You're going to get to go outside. It's probably going to be warmer outside. Folks, it happens to me all the time. I'm in the church building during the week. I'm freezing. And then I go outside. And, oh, it's nice. I'm used to it. But uh, I just want to encourage you. Uh, so it's things like, hey, we got that heating bill. It's only, it's only $727. So please write a check for that. Put it right in the uh, envelope. Uh, at the, the plates are up here, OK? So uh, I'm going to leave those there. Put your offering in there, if you will. Uh, uh, I would appreciate that uh, here. Uh, this week, uh, the Women's Bible Study is Tuesday, yes? Yes? Do you know who's teaching? I'm just curious. Marta? Marta's teaching. Uh-oh. Look out. Marta's teaching. I knew that. I knew that. I just forgot. But uh, Hey, okay, now one other thing. I didn't get him, but okay. The gardening. Let's just be honest, okay? It would be good this week. I mean, is, is that, that's out there. That's out there. On the board out here, okay? On the board, you're going to see a map of the garden plots. I, know, this is, I don't want to pressure you, but let me pressure you. Okay, we need to make some teams, get this gardening thing happening. So you go out there, get some people together, and make up a team. I need the first team of the early birds. Pete, what are you talking about? We need to plant the early things. Snow peas? All right. All right, we get the teams. Because right now, we have to plant snow peas, lettuce, and spinach. They need to go in the ground, preferably this week. It's time. Cold weather plants, okay? Now's the time. Don't worry about it. So please, go out there, get together, you know? Love one another. Say, I want to be in your team. Remember, you just have to get together, do some weeding and stuff. I'll water. I can do it. I'm going to water it anyway, so do that. Uh, I want to mention this. I, I don't know if you were interested in this. 